We begin today with an assessment of the GOP in the aftermath of the Fox defamation settlement. Here to talk about that and more is Republican State Senator and Budget Officer Declan O'Scanlan. Senator, always a pleasure, man. Good to see you. Same here, David. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So you tweeted recently, uh, I guess the day after the, the Fox settlement, time to put this issue, these claims, and all who perpetuate them behind us. Who are you talking to there? I'm talking to anybody who's going to perpetuate them. Yes, including uh, former President Trump. Uh, you know, can he pivot at this point and, and talk about relevant things? He absolutely can. And he could be pretty articulate when, when he puts his mind to it on the issues that, that people care about. This is no longer one of them. Uh, and, and we have to understand as a Republican Party, first off, what's our overarching mission? And then what's our goal in this upcoming election, uh, in next national election in, in 24? Uh, I think uh, those things overlap and winning and controlling policy needs to be our goal, not uh, perpetuating or, or affirming claims of stolen elections, which have been pretty thoroughly debunked now. But even if someone uh, wants to continue to debate those things, they are not the things that are going to win elections for Republicans. Uh, there's a number of people who said that more eloquently than I have, Governor Christie being one of them. Uh, but it's time. And you know, Fox News was the chief purveyor of these theories. And we now know that the chief purveyors who were doing it were trashing these theories uh, moments before they would go on air sometimes. Yeah. So it's time to put it behind us, uh, move on, and focus on the issues that swing voters who we can't win without care about. Well, you mentioned uh, Trump. Has the New Jersey party come to terms on the Trump question? Uh, no, I think, and it's probably a little early for that. Uh, but, you know, there's debate that's going on. I speak to a lot of folks, uh, and I think there's very open-minded debate. And I think that it is starting to be framed in the, in the, the way I put it before. We need to, to decide what our, our overarching goal is. Uh, if it is to win, then our path is absolutely clear. Again, we need to start talking about things that will persuade uh, middle of the road, undecided voters to come our way. We saw the negative impact that focusing on some of these tangential issues can have in last year's elections. That was supposed to be this massive red wave that that never materialized. Uh, it was it was a red ripple. Uh, we should have won the House by 60 seats. We should have won a majority in the Senate. Uh, we didn't do either one of those things. Uh, so that is a clear message to the Republican Party that, again, the folks that we need to win. And there's a high concentration of those swing voters here in New Jersey. But but those voters that we care about, who we need to care about and need to have with us uh, are ready for us to be over talking about those issues and ready for us to move on. Red Ripple. That sounds like a really delicious table wine. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. You, you called uh, your party a big tent party when, when we spoke a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, and I made a face and, and you made a face. Uh, that suggests a diversity of what? Thought in your party? Um, yeah, there is there's a pretty broad group. I just spoke to folks uh, walking by my house uh, uh, 20 minutes ago, uh, who said to me that they are looking for new energy in the Republican Party. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they won't necessarily vote for us unless we provide that energy. Uh, and they were pretty, these are pretty moderate folks. We talked about several issues. Uh, and there's room for those people in the party. And look, <laughs> we cannot be a party of purity uh, unless that is all we're going to be and be out of power. Uh, we need to be a party with conviction, uh, communicate areas. Look, I happen to be pro-life. There are plenty of people in the party and plenty of those swing voters who are pro-choice. There needs to be a discussion and dialogue between us with mutual respect. Uh, and there is room for that. And the party can do that. And it's shown in the past it could do that. Uh, so I really do believe we're a big tech party. Uh, and I believe that uh, this, you know, we can have that debate at the very top. And we can impress people with that fact and win over those voters. I'm absolutely confident of the that. Demo the Democrats that I talk to say there's two sides to your party, the right wing and the right wing nuts. Unfair? Uh, that is absolutely unfair. Uh, again, 
you know, Would you I say, though, that there are, are some wing nuts uh, uh, having a moment in your party right now? Look, there's wing nuts on both sides of the aisle, by the way. The crazy leftist nutcase progressives, uh, they're, they're a pretty big percentage of the Democratic Party. And they're in charge, by the way, at the national level. So they really need to worry about that. There are wing nuts, though. Yeah, there's there's look, there are colorful, interesting. And I say this uh, with affection, crazy people on both sides of the aisle. And both parties need those folks, too. We need to energize the base. Uh, if you don't, though, want to uh, get into bed with, with destructive people, I believe the, the Democratic Party has, has probably done that more from a policy perspective than the Republican Party has. But there is a limit. You, you know, there are uh, some wings of the party that you, you need to let them know that, you know, we're not going to pander to you. Uh, uh, but. Look, there's some really, really uh, brilliant, strong-leaning conservative or, or hardcore conservatives in the party who I genuinely like, uh, who can still have a dialogue, who can yeah. still realize that some of the people in the party they're going to disagree with, and be able to encourage people to vote for them too. We absolutely need that, and and I think we have that. We just need to uh, make sure this this happens consistently at, at the state level for this coming falls elections here in New Jersey, where we need to elect more legislators, Republican legislators, and then at the national level. It's going to be a fascinating couple of cycles coming up. We were talking, you you mentioned the, the state elections coming up, the entire legislature's up. We had Chris Russell and Dan Bryan on Chatbox this week. I asked about where Republicans expected to make some inroads, and Chris Russell rattled off a half dozen districts. Dan Bryan, same question, not a one. What does that say to you? Oh, uh, no, I think that there's there's a number of areas where uh, certainly regions where we have opportunities, where some of these districts overlay, uh, certainly down south. South Jersey has been trending uh, Republican really dramatically and interestingly now for a decade, uh, but certainly in a concentrated way in the past you know half dozen years. Uh, look at, at Mike Testa's district, for one. Uh, he's done a fabulous job as chairman, as senator, uh, really uh, turning that district around. I don't even know who's running against them on the D side. Uh, I think we probably know that name, but th they're not really even contesting it anymore. There's a number of areas where uh, we can make inroads, uh, you know, in central North Jersey as well. Uh, I think we have, have a real shot here. And look, we've got a great narrative. The, the, uh, it's very easy to tell the story of fiscal responsibility in New Jersey that Republicans have espoused for years. Uh, we could tell that story. Uh, we could tell about... Uh, our, our detailed plans for effective leadership that I think will appeal, again, to those key right-leaning swing voters that if we get them, we can win. All right. Uh, switching gears here, probably have time for this last question. Uh, we heard about Senate President Nick Scatari and some campaign spending that would have probably drawn a complaint from the Election Law Enforcement Commission, except that they're past the statute of limitations. I feel like we're going to start seeing a lot of this. Is there any way to make the uh, Elections Transparency Act smell good? There is not. It, it was it was a look, I could call it I could be generous and call it a tragic missed opportunity. Uh, I could be less generous and say it turned out to be exactly what the Democrats wanted, uh, which was to defang uh, the Election Law Enforcement Commission. Uh, that is what happened. So either way, it really was an awful piece of legislation. Nobody who voted for that piece of legislation can lay claim going forward to care about fair, honest, open, and accountable elections because the entity is irrelevant now. Uh, they, it's very hard to do these investigations within two years. It sounds like a long yeah. time, but you have candidates themselves who, who stall these, these investigations. It's really a shame. Uh, and no, there was a way. You could have fixed it pretty easily. Not you could have gone to five year statute of limitations from 10, cut it in half, would have been reasonable. You could have left some independence as far as the commission members and the choice of the executive director uh, not being of all of these people all appointed by the governor. Uh, it really smells. Yeah. And it's a shame. All right. Senator Declan O'Scanlan, great to see you, man. Thanks for taking a few minutes with us. David, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.